Okay. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Um, but what if I told you the future, the future is going to be very different from what we've been used to. Uh, all this talk of economic collapse and civil war and all that kind of stuff uh, will no longer be a concern in like a decade or less. Okay. Uh, also, our currently crushing national debt will f- is going to fall to near zero and with not, without even like a lot of effort. Unlikely, but okay. And third, lastly, the, the ideological wars that we are experiencing today will vanish within just a couple of years from now and they'll never return again. You're definitely smoking something. <laughs> um, but that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Let's go. They're, we're going to be talking about the current dire state of our debt and the social fabric in America. Uh, something called an 80 year p- cycle of polarization, debt, and war in America. And that there have been four previous cycles to the one that we're in right now. And we may be about to enter uh, a fifth one or ne- the next one, like very soon. Hmm. Keep in mind, I'm not an expert on economics or history. I'm just reporting on all the data that I've assembled. Um, so let's begin. The, the crisis of American debt. The debt in the United States surpassed 100% of the economy in 2020 for the first time since 1946. Um, Basically, it's been heading steadily up for since like the late 60s, early 70s. And you can see here, uh, second red arrow, it just passed 100% during this latest period. That's crazy. Um, Here's a sort of wider, going back to... Mm -hmm first part of the 20th century you can see world war the big world war ii one there and now you can see the red arrow you can see where that, that's where we're at again and we're going straight up well yeah this is the congressional budget office projections this is our congress accounting office projects that that's what it's going to look like this is not somebody trying to scare you this is just a regular you know <laughs> that's what they think is going to happen it's kind of it's kind of weird um this goes all the way back to the beginning of the, of the country, right? 1790 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Each red arrow is a peak in debt. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is where we're at right now. Just yeah. went straight up just recently to, to hit like a new record of more than World War II. Uh, it's not just about debt and the gold standard. Um, there's actually more to it than that. If you're a gold bug and you think it's just, oh, it's just that we went, you know, we went off the gold standard. Well, the debt actually has causes that are not economic. They, they're, they're cultural. You could even say that debt is not the cause of our problems. It's, the, it's just a symptom, right? Okay. Um, over the last four or five decades, America has become essentially two nations. We talked about the two peoples in one country mm-hmm. and we can't agree on anything, right? No so um, that's really the cause. That's really the cause of our problems. What does it mean to be two nations, mm-hmm. two people in one country? Mm-hmm. Well, okay. So one group of people, one group of people believes in a thing called egalitarianism, that we should pursue equality in all things. The other group believes in something called, their worldview is something called complementarianism. That means people can be equal in moral worth, but still be uh functionally different and complementary, right? So this is where these two worldviews, this is where we get the divide in politics. We start having this divide between left and right. And you might think, well, we've always had that. If you're, if you're a younger yeah. person, under 40, you've never mm-hmm. seen a time, you've never known a time when America wasn't, uh, if you weren't around when say Ronald Reagan, went, you wouldn't have ever known a time when America wasn't a completely divided into two, two countries. Basically. Two people, you know, right? right? But this was not at all the case in the yeah. past. Yeah. Here's a perfect example. Uh, 1932 election, Roosevelt versus Hoover. All of America, but except for a few mm-hmm. states, mm-hmm. chooses Roosevelt. We all decide Roosevelt's the guy, right? Uh, let's, 1972, oh, yeah. Nixon versus McGovern. Obviously, we all, everybody in America, Same. totally like consensus. We all agree Nixon's the guy. Um, one state. 
disagrees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, California, you know, is all for it's all for Nixon. New York State, you know, we can't even imagine this today. Uh, 1984 election, Ronald Reagan. Again, yes. only one state goes for the other candidate. That everybody goes for the Republican, the uh, Ronald Reagan, right? California, New York State, you name it. Everybody, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Goes for Ronald Reagan, right? Mm-hmm. This is unthinkable, but this was only 1984. That wasn't that long ago. No. So uh, this is this is a, you can see it on this chart. You can see those that red arrow represents 1971, right? And that's right where the positions of the major parties, the, which were very very close, they were almost the same. Yeah. Prior to 1970, I remember uh, that was a complaint. they start diverging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They start diverging, and they just keep on diverging, ever more farther apart, ever after, right until mm-hmm. today. And so that's why you get, um, that's why you get this thing where every every election we have, every damn election looks like this now, because it's not, you know, yeah. we're, we got two yeah. yep. countries, and now we talk about civil, you know, people talking about civil war and all that stuff, right? So it's important to recognize that we've been here before. Basically, that's that that's if there's anything positive, we can at least accept that we've been here before in America. We've actually been here three times before. We've had this kind of crushing debt. We've had, I mean, a civil war, you know, let's face it. People were dying mm-hmm. in, in, you know, across all of America. Mm-hmm. That That's a absurdly bad place compared to where we are now. Uh, so so we've been here before. We've been here three times before. This chart shows clearly this is all the way back to the beginning. Each red line represents the peak of, of debt. We've definitely been here before. Yeah. Right. I can see that. Um, we had the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War II. Each time we had unsustainable debt. Okay. But where's the war this time? If like, We don't have a war this time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's true. We don't have a, uh, we have the debt, but we don't have anything like any mm-hmm. of these wars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um and that's a big question, but there, so here's, here's a possibility and it's, and it's something called, um, the war on poverty. <laughs> uh, this, okay. Lyndon Johnson in 1960s began something called the war on poverty. And this administration today, here and now declares unconditional war on poverty in America. And I urge... All right. Um, This was a massive program, bigger than anything before in, in American history in terms of like, I mean, not even close. I mean, it was just... It's unimaginably large um, government program. Uh, there hadn't been really big government programs prior to this time. And this was, we had a poverty rate of 22% in 1960, right? Yes. And the idea was, oh, we were going to eliminate poverty. And, but what, one thing we did do is we spent a ton of money. So we spent more than all the wars in American history combined on the war on poverty. Okay, but isn't World War II is tiny compared to you know this spending? But isn't that great? We we spent all that money on helping people rather than on war, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, so better than war. Um, but there's a there's a definitely a problem, right? Okay. The war on poverty didn't do a very good job of reducing poverty. Um, it was we still quite... have to help the poor, right? <laughs> I mean, you got. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but we're, I mean, you got to understand, we're talking, when I say it didn't do a very good job, I mean that, so take a look at this graph here. So recently, the the Biden administration sort of trumpeted that we had reached a new low, new record low in poverty, right? Well, that sounds great. But Mm -hmm. when was the last time we had the record low? Well, it was 1973, we haven't gone down below that 1973 until now. Yeah, just at least now. it's not 1971. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, reducing poverty actually was being reduced 
for all, for many years prior to 1970, mm-hmm. the early 70s, right? Mm-hmm. And and then it just stopped going down. It stayed at that um, 16% or whatever level since they started sp- spending all that money and it's never gone down below, you know, so it, it just, it just stayed flat. So we've spent more money than, than all the wars combined, but it hasn't done anything at all to reducing poverty. So you can see this, you've got the first yellow arrow, $5 trillion for world war two created that level of debt. And my thesis here is that the war on poverty, Mm -hmm. it seems reasonable to me to say, if we believe that this 5 trillion created this, and these are in absolute dollars, uh, constant dollars. So if that's 5 trillion created this World War II debt, don't we kind of have to accept that it's pretty possible, likely that this $22 trillion created this debt, this debt that we have now, right? That doesn't sound crazy. Um, Mm. So in other words, it may be that the war on poverty unintentionally acted as the equivalent of the same kind of issues that caused a rise in polarization and debt in the past cycles in America, right? Now here, here is some good news. Yes. (laughs) If this acted like, if this, thing of this war on poverty. Mm-hmm. If it acted like a quote, a war, mm-hmm. then it might also end the same way that other wars have ended. Now, how did other wars end it? Well, if you look back, you will see that all of the major wars in American history have ended decisively. This is kind of unique to America. Uh, I'm talking about the major no, wars, not any small okay, wars. Okay. The major wars in America have ended decisively. The belligerent party has always made a full and permanent surrender. So for example, the British the monarchists, right? The South, um, in the Civil War, the Axis powers in World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, it, when it ended, it ended. We didn't keep fighting the, su- the Southerners or, you know, um, mm-hmm. there weren't like runs well, on the, you know, in, into I mean, the North. It, mm-hmm. it, it just ended and it was over. So the political and moral order that the belligerent party stood for was vanquished at the end of the war. You never heard anything about what they stood for after that time, at least not in any mainstream anything. Well, you mean like the good? And then, and then, and then, you know, beyond that, debt at after the end of each war, debt reduced quickly, and even with not a lot of effort. So here you see the same chart. These green lines represent how fast show you how fast okay. the debt came down. Right? That would be nice. That's really fast. well. You'd have to have another one of these green lines at the end here. Right. And this last red line would have to have a you know green line right after it, and we'd have to see debt just you know come right down. Right. Mm-hmm. And you might, well, how in the world is that going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so if America is going to survive, we're going to need to see another one of these. It's going to have to take, it's going to have to take like mm-hmm. 20 years, like the next 20 years. You mean? We'd have to see the debt come down in the next 20 years, right? Like at a, a high lot. speed? Yeah, at a high speed. I think that would be very good. It would be, but yes. but but it's like, how is that going to happen? Yeah. So the question is, what's we've got this war going on. Mm-hmm. Like a cultural, people talk about a culture war. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything is apocalyptic, you know, language. I know. Uh, clearly, that has to end in order for the debt to come down dramatically, right? Oh yes. So, what's going to bring this to an end? Mm-hmm. That this state that we've got in, we're in right now. All right. Well, let's look at past periods. Okay. So here we've got way back beginning of America. The war of the monarchy versus the republic. Okay. Uh, there's different phases of that, right? Ending mm-hmm. in the Revolutionary War. You got, um, there we go. Civil War, slavery versus abolition. Um, yep. The are... next, uh, next one, World War II, dictatorship versus democracy. Yep. And now you have the one that we are involved in today. We and our parents. I grew up with, this is what we're familiar with. Cold War, you know, different, you know, we, it began with us being very concerned about the communists, right? Mm-hmm. Soviet, Soviet mm-hmm. Union. Yep. Um, well, let's look at those different periods in this latest one that we're in, mm-hmm. this latest cycle that we're in. So the first one you get is 1950s. 
communism versus anti-communism. This was on everybody's mind. The spread of communism was, was the biggest fear that everyone had. Yes, I can see that. In recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. May Day brings a wave of anti-communist sentiment as 100,000 march down New York Fifth Avenue in a loyalty parade. Everyone from vets to youngsters reveals his inborn dislike of communism. All right, so th things were very, very, very different from today. For one thing, corporations, we have a lot of corporations are very involved in, in mm -hmm. social issues today. Well, they were very involved in social issues back then, just in a completely different way. Here's an ad campaign. Uh, this is two magazine ad campaign. Uh, the theme of this was, do we actually know where to face communism? And they, they talk about one has got communism and twisted education. It talks about you know, communists in education. The other one is communism and Christianity and communism in our churches. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's almost impossible to believe what, you know, let's, let's read one of these, right? Imagine Google or Starbucks or something talking like this communism and twisted education in the eyes of communists. A child is simply something to be warped into one shape, godless, ignorant of moral responsibility, devoid of intellectual honesty, a creature of the state. In its drive for world power, communism has found it's most profitable to influence teachers and alter textbooks, to use the intimate bond between teacher and scholar, to spread doubts about the old ways and Christian ethics, to insinuate ideas of atheism, regimentation, and false idealism in their place. We parents and teachers alike need to be on our guard to keep our children free from communism. Wasted would be all other defenses, navies, armies, air forces, if communism could take the citadel from within. And this is a Canada there. Uh, that's basically like Boeing mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. Huge company. And, and you saw this all over the place. That was the, the level of the tenor of what people were hearing in the 1950s. Yeah, they were large. Canada Air was the... Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, you know, we're talking literally like the biggest companies in the world. This is the type of things they were talking about. Yeah. And they're advertising mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, next, 1960s, the sexual revolution. Uh, of course, peace and love and all that stuff. Uh, the leader of the sexual revolution or the new left was Herbert Marcuse. Herbert Marcuse, in a nutshell, was blending Freudianism and Marxism. His message essentially was that America was semi-fascist. You know, next was 1970s, mm. feminism, all about the equality of men and women, obviously. Uh, the, the leader, the intellectual leader of that group was Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, and her, she was married Sartre. to Sartre, which is, you know, pretty crazy. Next is woke capitalism, which is the, what we've been going through in the last 10 years, I suppose. And that's one way of putting that is the pursuit of equity and inclusion. Yeah. Uh, there are various things that but that's mostly it. It's the idea that equality isn't enough. Mm -hmm. You need equity. You've got big, big, big companies. Yes. All involved in this sort of social messaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it didn't used to be a thing, although, you know, well, well I mean, that, it was a thing in the back mm -hmm. in the 1950s, they were, mm -hmm. it was, but it was completely different. You know, Disney, you know, pride parades and all this kind of stuff. So in every previous war in America, mm -hmm. If you look at the different, who's on which side? Yeah. One side represented the continuance of a norm that was no longer being accepted, uh, a social and moral norm that right, people thought, right, like right. like slavery, what people no longer thought that that was yes. acceptable. Yes, yes. And so that so we had this war. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the you know monarchy. Americans didn't want monarchy anymore. Slavery. Americans didn't want slavery anymore. Uh, dictatorship. Now we want a democracy. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. this is how this these cycles in, Amer okay. in American history. This is how they go. It's always something over a moral issue. Now the, the last thing we need to ask ourselves is who was the establishment 
uh, was it the left or the right? After 1943 in America, which party was the dominant party? Which which group was the establishment? Because every single time, yeah, yeah, every single cycle, it was the established party, party with the most you know uh, yeah. influence in America. Yeah, that was the belligerent, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we can act, answer the question of who was the the most powerful party. Okay. Definitively. Mm-hmm. Let's look at actual the history, right? So this is the control of the U.S. House and Senate going all the way back to 1855. Okay. The reddish uh, rectangle there is when Republicans controlled. The bluish areas uh. where Democrats controlled. Uh, and one really interesting thing is that we were talking about how you have to have 60 votes in the Senate. Right, right. Well, there's only been two periods in the last, you know, since before the Civil War, there's only been two periods where major le- legislation has been enacted in America. Okay. And that's, you can see on these these little r- black circles here. That was right after the Civil War. Yeah. And right after the, right when the Great Depression happened. Okay. Those are the only two times. And one was Republican. They own, they controlled everything in the, in the Senate and the House. And then during the, the Great Depression, the Democrats controlled everything in the Senate and the House. And they were able to enact these America changing mm-hmm. legislation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you also have at the end, ending period of a, of a cycle, mm-hmm. you have a, a time when no one has enough power to, to, to make any legislation. So these circles, these black circles represent the ending phase and nobody's got 60 votes, even close. Nobody can do anything. And so the period just before, uh, like in the 1920s, Everyone was complaining about how it was a do-nothing Congress, yeah, yeah, it was gridlock, yeah, yeah, just like yeah, we have been today. Yeah. No difference. Yeah. All right. Now, you might think interesting, interesting correlations. Yeah. Why should we believe this is truly? I mean, this isn't a scientific thing. Right. Uh, I don't have, there isn't enough data here to, to be a scientific model. Uh, so it's interesting, but how do we know it's going to repeat, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, one reason is because these time periods are very similar. I'm not going to say eerily similar, but they are very similar. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. let's look. These are the period, you know, these are the general periods leading up to the wars. And then you look at just the turning points of the wars. So 1783, 1863, 1943. 80 years. Yeah, it's so it's 80 years between the first group, 80 years between the next group. And it's exact, mm-hmm. right? I mean, mm-hmm. um, I, I'm not trying to do like numerology here or something, mm-hmm. but it is, mm-hmm. I'm just saying there's something intriguing that, that, that these are so close, right? So the next time would be mm-hmm. 2023. If now you're at the end of a cycle, <laughs> right? It would, be, it would be next year. Okay. So you're saying, hmm. And you think, oh, yeah, well, you know, so what? But we did. It's true. We have reached a record high in debt exactly within the 80 year time frame that we were yep. supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you wanted to demonstrate that here's, here's that chart again. Mm-hmm. I got a yellow line here. Yep. And if you were to take that and copy and paste it, right. Boom. It's exactly the same. You can see, you know, just visually you can see copy and paste it again. Boom. And it's, it's the same, right? Yep. I think that's interesting. It's encouraging. Uh, <laughs> I think that's interesting. So let's say you're not convinced, but you do find it intriguing. And you, your question might be, okay, if this cycle is true, what comes next? Okay. That's a natural question. It would be interesting. What would come next? Well, here we go. So if history were to be, you know, repeat itself, you would see the changes over just the next couple of decades. You would see polarization would be reduced to an insignificant level. In other words, America would become one nation again. Mm -hmm. As with monarchy, slavery, dictatorship, these historical, you know, periods. If history were repeated, and I suppose you could think this is a good thing or a bad thing, but one example would be we would no longer ever hear in the mainstream Anybody referring to so, to Marxism or socialism positively ever again? Wow. You know, and I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm just saying from history, we never heard about 
monarchy again. We never heard about slavery again. We never heard about dictatorship again. Positively, you mean? Yeah, from the main yeah. from the mainstream. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so since this period was about communism versus anti-communism, then nothing associated with about that. Okay, so you might say that's really unlikely, uh, but of course, you know, if you look back at 1943 in the middle of the World War II, you know, people would say that's pretty unlikely then too. Uh, or 1863. Now let's talk about what happens to the debt, this unsustainable debt that no one has any solution for. Uh, we know that it's happened before. We know that it has gone down mm-hmm. before, but how does that happen? Yes. Right. I mean, well, what happens is that the economy at the beginning of a cycle expands at a level that is unlike any other time period. Okay. So to get an idea mm-hmm. of the growth of the economy, let's look at after the civil war. So in 1850, there were 9,000, mm. there were 9,000 miles of railroads. Excellent. By 1890, just 40 years later, there were 163,000 miles of railroads. That's and in 10 years, between 1880 and 1890, there were 70,000 miles laid just in 10 years. That's oh, a, So the, the economy yeah. then was just like, I mean, really, really red hot. Um, it's, it's just exploding. Mm-hmm. Uh, next, let's look at our time period from yeah. more, more recent. 1945 to 1974, just 29 years, the economy doubled during that time. The size of the economy completely doubled. The next time it doubled, it took 43 years, right, after 74. So so huge, huge growth. That's That just basically means in 20 years, we'll dwarf the size of the economy today. And the and the, and that will make the, the debt just not, a, not an issue. As hard as it is to imagine. It's just yeah. not, it's not an issue. Even more surprising, there's going to be an explosion in new births, like like huge. Okay. Like the baby boom, right? So these are the two last times we had baby booms. We obviously we had one in after World War II. Well, we had one after the Civil War too. Huge, right? So okay. that's just it. Just that's what happens after, when it's over when the when the war period is over. You, you can even see, this is odd, you know, you can see th- this is the control of the Senate and the House when the legislation was done. Well, those black circles there, those represent the very same years that the baby booms are happening, right? So this here, the very same years as that there. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's a natural way that it repeats. All right. Well, is there is there an 80-year historical cycle? Um well, we will find out. We will find out mm-hmm. pretty soon, actually. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe the, maybe the debt will just be like this. Oh. Right? <laughs> so, or you can believe in this this, this crazy theory. Right? Well, uh, <laughs> I think I'd, I'll pick your theory. <laughs> All right. Well, if you enjoyed what you just heard or would like to at least consider looking at more of this, you just smash the like button, hit that bell, subscribe, and have yourself a great day. Bye-bye.